You're someone with a vision for your practice, for your side hustle, and for your personal journey. But when it comes to establishing your path on how to get to where you want to be with your practice, things get a little messy. You're also someone who'd prefer to go in person instead of to groups and listening to everyone else's story. To me, it sounds like you could benefit from one-on-one consulting with our experienced practice of the practice consultants. From $5.95 a month and up, you can work with a consultant that will give you more direction and practical tried and tested tips matched to you and your goals. For more information, visit practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. Again, that's practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. This is the Practice of the Practice Podcast with Joe Sanox, session number 888. I'm Joe Sanox, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice Podcast. You know, the first year that I host Killing It Camp uh, out in Estes Park, Colorado, uh, we had 120, 130 people at that that conference. And I remember I was doing a, a kickoff activity where I looked out at the room and I said, imagine on the far right side of this, this ballroom was your comfort zone. Imagine right in the middle was your growth zone. And on the far left was your panic zone. And I said to people, I'm going to just throw things out and I want you to physically put yourself on that spectrum. Uh, and I said things like skydiving, if you had to go skydiving, and some people were total panic zone, like, you know, putting their hands and body against the wall. Other people were super comfortable with that. And then I'd you know, say other things like eating sushi, you know, maybe some people hadn't had sushi. So that'd be a little growth zone area. Uh, and I was doing this where I just kind of throw out some simple things. And then I started to throw out some kind of deeper life events type things. And then I still remember this moment when I said, making more money than other therapists in your community. And almost 100% of the people went to the comfort zone area. A couple of people in the growth zone, but almost 100% of the people were in the comfort zone. And what that really showed me is when you have the right audience, especially at a live conference, um, something magical happens where we right away could start at that conference saying, we are with our people. We are with our people that get us, that we want to run awesome businesses that do good in the world, but that also make us money. And if we make more than our peers, we're not going to have money shame around that. We're not going to be all down on ourselves. We're not going to be the typical, you know, social worker counseling martyrs. Uh, But instead, right away, we could quickly fast forward into, oh my gosh, I'm with my people. And that's what I love about conferences that are highly specialized is that you can right away know, like, these are my people. And that's why I'm bringing Steve Turney uh, on the show today. Steve has been the brains behind an amazing conference called the Mental Health Marketing Conference. And in 2018, uh, in collaboration with the conference founder, Austin, uh, he worked to grow the conference by focusing on delivering an excellent event that provides value to anyone who attends, speakers, sponsors, and Steve lives a life that's ha- that has experienced positive progress and outcomes because of mental health care and coaching. Steve's worked across a range of verticals, including complex healthcare systems within full service marketing agencies, software as a service, all sorts of things. So I'm just so excited. This is the first time that Steve and I have hung out and already I can tell we're cut from the same cloth. Steve, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Joe, thank you. I'm delighted to be on the practice of the practice. Yeah. So I love seeing this bio. Uh, Tell us a little bit of your backstory of how you got into putting on this conference and really got into, you know, mental health marketing. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, to sort of fast forward to uh, the action in the story, um, the conference itself was, as you mentioned, not founded by me. It was founded by a friend, Austin Harrison, and he had had a couple long-term relationships, um, one where uh, it was discovered that uh, the person he was dating had uh, uh, was experiencing bipolar disorder, and uh, the next relationship, his significant other, uh, it was essentially a psychotic break, um, and it caught him on his heels. And so being in the healthcare hub of Nashville, Tennessee, he started a conversation And uh, it was around mental health, which he didn't know a lot about, except that when he looked into it, he could tell that the marketing 
really needed to level up. And this was almost a decade ago. So, <laughs> oh, it, oh man. Yeah. I started practicing the practice. Uh, it was 11 years ago and yeah, yeah, it, it's getting better, but it still needs a lot of help. That's for it, sure. Yeah. There's still work to do and there's always work to do in our lives. Uh, we're never going to probably meet the Buddha on the road to mental health marketing. Um, but at the time it was a lot of, you know, solopreneurs hang up a shingle and, uh, what's a website? I've never taken a marketing class. I don't know a biz. You know, I didn't haven't taken much, many business courses. So Austin really met a need for four or five years, and uh, sort of like Atlas, he was he was holding up this conference on his own. Um, I turned forty and went to a uh, a monastery for a silent retreat, um, and came away with this idea of help people in need. So really, those four words have transformed my life, um, but not immediately. I started to do clumsy things like uh, fill up people's cars with gas if they were stopped on the side of the road instead of turning a blind eye. And and then in pretty short order, it led me to realize that I could help myself tremendously and probably most effectively by starting at the core uh, of my own sort of emotional and mental health work. So that led me to a licensed professional counselor in the Nashville market and came away with um, not just career guidance, which was sort of the guise that I went into uh, talk therapy, but really um, a, a transformation of myself. And so I was having coffee with my friend Austin and he said, you know, he, he had a baby on the way and leg surgery was in the near future, I think. And, and he just said, man, this is, this is a tough ride. And I said, how can I help? And so I started to book the speakers and the sponsors. And we did a 2019 conference in Nashville. And then 2020, of course, we had to pivot and adjust and change like everybody in their own way had to do. And, and we did a virtual conference in 2020, which was exciting. Uh, we had 700 plus people register. And wow. then, yeah, it was, it was amazing kind of, and, and from all over the world, it was fascinating. Um, and in 2021, Austin and I are having a heart to heart and he decides to step back from the conference. It was never his sort of 10 year vision to have a conference, but what he started was so incredible. So I said, Hey, I'm, I'm loving this work. I'm, I'm actually leaning into it. So uh, we postponed 21, and in 2022, uh, again, we held it in Nashville, and it was just a, a phenomenal, exciting um, collection of people who came together. It's a, it's a real, like you said, it's a it's a it can be a real magical community, and that's that's kind of the experience um, I have too with with watching the conference take on a life of its own after we do all the logistics and all the planning. So that gets us to today, where we're planning our our next conference uh, in September. Well, I, I love so many things that you said there, um, especially that idea of this kind of magical community, because you know even if those same people hang out the next year, they're going to be different people. And so that idea of mm -hmm. this is a community that we have for just a handful of days uh, that we can dig deep into these things we care about and to be around people that can reinforce that. You know, this this work that's often so lonely uh, that you're with your people uh, for this short period of time. I, I love that. I love that your own mental health kind of growth and journey uh, can I manifest in this conference. Now, um, I want to kind of have part of this interview be around trends that you've noticed kind of in marketing uh, for for private practices, because, as you know, you know, most of our listeners are, you know, mental health professionals. We have some coaches, we have some dentists and massage therapists lately, but mostly it's counselors, social workers, MFTs, psychologists. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you noticing in in and around marketing private practices, marketing mental health like? What's shifted, you know, in the last few years since you've been doing this since 2019, primarily? Yeah, I call it a tidal wave, and it's something that I'm simply trying to stay on the surfboard and surf and provide um, value and watch the trends. So, and it's a little bit of a contrarian concept. I think most people would say, uh, you know, in, in some cases, who needs to market right now? You know, and I would say. Um, there's a there's another viewpoint, which is that demographically right now we're throttled at the let's say 41 year old to 55 year old. It's just a bottleneck, and it gets real tight. We don't have nearly enough of those professionals in most industries, and it's especially pronounced in healthcare and mental health care. 
and behavioral health. So I think what's interesting to see is that is that age group is, you know, who is typically a physician or a nurse practitioner or, or, or a clinician or provider of mental health care. And though, and that demographic is going to uh, wash through sooner than later. And so we need to be prepared for that. And that's not many years away from there being this easing of uh, access in some in some ways. Now, that's not to say we're going to solve entirely for access. But what's happening at the same time is that, and we've seen this in the last three to five years, that private equity uh, got very interested and a little bit frothy with uh, investing in behavioral health companies and trying to solve for scale. And there are, you know, mental health care companies that are looking at opening dozens or hundreds of, uh, you know, new offices or locations across the country in the next two to three years. And, um, and, and then there's technology companies that are trying to solve for maybe fractional access or, you know, micro solutions or solutions for uh, some aspect of mental health care. So all that to say, I think it would be important for uh, anybody in your audience in any kind of clinical or provider capacity to continue to um, play the long game of building your brand. And when I think of brand, there are two definitions that come to mind, and and neither of them are my own. Um, But one is that a brand is a path to a position of advantage. So uh, no, no industry is comfortable forever. Um, you know, that is the pendulum is always swinging. And while things are fat right now, things may be lean in a few years. And that's just the nature of, of markets is because there's, you know, there's a balancing, there's a homeostasis. We return to the mean essentially. Um, so all that to say, you know, one, one way to continue to build your brand is to, um, be very clear and communicate about the things that you're you're best at, the work you want to do, the work that's most profitable for you. Um, nobody can boil the ocean, you know. As much as we want to work globally and solve every problem, oftentimes we have to work locally, and sometimes growth happens through pruning. We see that in nature in any number of yeah. ways. Um, you know, we see we see the um, the discipline of the orchard rather than the forest, and both of those are beautiful. Um, but the other definition of, of brand is simply, what are you promising that you're going to later deliver? And so from a market standpoint and a marketing standpoint, that's where I would double down is building the trust, um, building the, the, the humanity that you can show um, before, you can, before you get into the room. And I know you sometimes need to remove yourself from the room in certain cases, um, but um, but what you can do to um, connect, connect and play the long game uh, with your brand right now, I think if you're intending to be in business in five or 10 years, it's going to be a very different landscape. Mm. I love that. I love those two definitions that you gave, uh, the path to the position of advantage and what are you promising that later you'll deliver? Uh, those are two great definitions of branding. Now, I, I think you sit in a really unique position because you have a marketing hat, you have your software as a service background, and also this mental health uh, expertise in just being around so many different companies and clinicians that are in this space. It's like you're at the center of that Venn diagram of marketing software and mental health. Um, What do you think therapists from a marketing perspective should be focusing on right now? And what do you think they should be ignoring? Mm. Well, I think we can... I think therapists should be um, very focused on communicating probably on one channel, one solution, and targeting one person or one one demographic, let's say, as a way to get very crystal clear about the types of people you either are best qualified to to help or if you want to work at the top of your licensure or you know the, the top of your focus um, right now since there's there's no shortage of people that you can help it's really important I think to to get laser focused and and drill deep into um, into the channel that you want to use and 
getting really good about repeating yourself in fresh ways. And oftentimes I think, and we see this in so many industries and you're right, I'm sort of a, a polymath and I, I pull from different industries within and without healthcare. So um, with that context, you know, the temptation is always to try to help as many people as we can or try to provide services for as many people as we can. And and we we service a lot of marketing agencies. They come to learn from your audience and our, our presenters about uh, the language of mental health, which I think is just as critically important as as we see group practices grow and, and regional practices and these, these nationwide pushes, they're hiring marketing firms. And those marketing firms, in some cases, are very eloquent in mental health. And sometimes there's quite a bit of a learning curve. So I think that's as much of the value that we provide as we do um, with education of the therapist who may need to learn about TikTok or LinkedIn or, or channels like that. And so um, I, I think I think focusing is important. So to the point of the marketing agency, we'll see the generalist firm. You know, we design websites and we do advertising and marketing for any industry anywhere. Well, I don't know what you do, and it it lowers uh, my perceived trust in your ability to um, communicate with me about your expertise. So um, rather than sort of getting distracted by Maybe the new channels, the newest channels that are out there. Certainly, we see um, people succeeding and thriving on new social media channels. Uh, I defer back to one of the best marketers in our time, I think, Seth Godin, who says, mm. uh, bring me the stuff that's dead, please. And, uh, you know, when I moved to Nashville in 2008, I worked for an email marketing service provider called Emma. It was this cheeky little brand that grew up and helped a lot of small and mid-sized businesses. And at the time, email marketing was um, not quite the commodity that it is today. It was driving still healthy ROI, um, but it was a little little sexier back then. Now everybody knows about email marketing, but still it's, it's where transactions happen. It's where you own your audience. And it had an early mover advantage that I think gets overlooked um, in favor of sort of the new shiny thing. So that's what I would say is, um, you know, for an industry like this, that isn't always early adopter, early mover, you can, you can really um, communicate well with some channels that have been proven. Going in network with insurance can be tough. I know when I took insurance, there were long wait times and it was so confusing. Filing all the right paperwork is time consuming and tedious. And even after you're done, it can take months to get credentialed and start seeing clients. That's why Alma makes it easy and financially rewarding to accept insurance. When you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access enhanced reimbursement rates with major payers. They also handle all of the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions and guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. Once you've joined Alma's insurance program, you can see clients in your state of licensure, regardless of where you're working from. It's amazing to know that you can be fully online. Learn more about building a thriving practice with Alma at helloalma.com forward slash Joe. That's hello. A L M A dot com slash Joe to get started. I love that you uh, bring up that Seth Godin quote. I had forgot that. And uh, actually, that's a lot of what we're looking at is uh, doing even direct mail marketing uh, to people uh, of getting highly specialized lists of therapists that are new to private practice and um, and just sending a mail and, you know, eventually you know, doing our magazine again. That was something we did um, in per We did a physical one and then we ended up you know pausing that and just doing a digital one that, that was, you know, I think there's so much digital out there. But, you know, if you get a physical magazine and it's just sitting on your dining room table, you're like, oh, I'll read an article or two. Uh, and just going back to the, those old school things that you know worked for a really long time that a lot of people have jumped out of. So yeah, mm -hmm. thanks so much for bringing that up again. Yeah. Um, what if, about if things can, that you? Yeah, go ahead, jump in. Can I pile on that? Oh, please yeah. do. 
Awesome. So there's a there's a concept I love. It's an author by the name of Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And he taught me about um, through his books, taught me about the Lindy effect, which is that for sort of, you know, non non human things, um, basically, um, there's an expectation that uh, let me let me phrase this better. Like if you looked out at all the planets in the universe and um you did you calculated the age of all those planets on average uh the planets uh that are sort of that are uh <laughs> joe i'm struggling on this but i'll get there no i love this let's, let's okay. let you struggle <laughs> yeah let me struggle so um things that have existed um in out in the universe have basically an equal amount of chance of existing that much farther into the future. So when you look at young planets versus old planets, let's say, on average, the old planets have a likelihood of existing that much longer into the future. Um, so it's sort of a bell curve distribution um, that we can look at. So um, we we apply that to technology today, let's say, and we can say, well, the fork and the chopsticks have been around forever. And we haven't really improved off of sharp little sticks that help us put food in our mouth. Or um, books is another one that Taleb talks about, like the paperback book. Um, you know, some people love the nook and they take it on the plane and they say, hey, I can, I can hold a thousand books in here. And it becomes a question of, well, how many can you read on a, on a plane? Right. And, uh, and the argument is, well, the Nook feels almost like, an ex almost like a paperback book. And Taleb would respond and say maybe, well, you know what's exactly like a paper book is a paper book. And that's, that's the experience we want. So that's a, clum that's a clumsy sort of uh, offshoot. But I think there's an application there. When you're talking about direct mail or email marketing and an early mover advantage, Email marketing has um, the the very likelihood or possibility that it will exist way farther out into the future than, let's say, a TikTok, simply because it's stood the test of time and uh, it has the potential to, um, you know, to acquire market share and get momentum ahead of some of these other um, technologies that maybe maybe have a quick rise, uh, but then maybe a quick fall, a quick symmetrical fall. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like a, a mouse trap. You know, people say build a better mouse trap, but it's like the current mouse trap is super cheap to make, and people know it works. And it's like, well, why would I try something new? <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, mouse traps still look like mouse traps. They do, they do. Well, and I love that idea of you know taking that idea of the planets or you know things in space that you know if if they're trillions of years old statistically they're likely to survive another trillion years, whereas something that's brand new is more likely to to disappear and be short lived. And, and you know, I mean, you, you've we've seen this. You know, I remember Periscope, which was you know the live feed like video platform that everyone was on for a minute, and then it's like you know Facebook, which was established, just added live video like to what they did. And then Periscope completely disappeared, except for I'm sure there's still people on it that, you know, if they like it are going to be mad at me about this. But, uh, but that idea that there are things that are established and, you know, maybe start there. And if you're interested in TikTok or whatever the next thing is, like do it out of a hobby more than that you're putting all your eggs in that basket around marketing. Now, Steve, what would you say are temptations or squirrels or things like that, that people should probably ignore that. And I think you were kind of getting to that in this, maybe um, kind of subtly, like where would you say it's kind of a waste of therapist time or their team's time in regards to marketing? Hmm. Yeah. And you summarized that uh, so eloquently. So thank you for, uh, for making that point. Um, I think the shiny things and maybe the time wasters that come to mind in this day and this space are, I don't know that therapists' best use of their time is doing their own marketing in many cases. Um, so oftentimes, you know, you're, you're the executive director and maybe you're providing some, some clinical care and you're also doing the accounting and you're also doing the hiring and firing. And I think there's a real opportunity to specialize. And I think there's a big missed opportunity uh, if you're continuing to, in many cases, uh, hold all of those 
uh, things in your own arms and wear all those hats. So, you know, I, I've struggled with that with my conference. I mean, I can certainly empathize through lived experience of, you know, you definitely want to, I think most everybody wants to deliver super high quality work. And I think we hold our own work in high regard and, and that's important and that's great. I think that's the right attitude. It it becomes a matter of how can we, how can we keep pace with the market today and, and create a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. And that might mean, you know, hiring even a virtual assistant or hiring some outsourced fractional marketing support or, you know, uh, like bringing in an accounting software and service that makes your life easier. There's so many efficiencies and so much innovation happening right now that I think um, if we're if we're too insulated and too maybe afraid or maybe there's a lot of drivers um, to why we're not making those decisions, that's that's something I would um, probably warn against or just to make it a positive point. Consider that there are people who have gone to just as much school and have uh, have just as many years of professional education and, and experience about marketing as you do about therapy. And how can you make the best use of, of their skill set? And, and if you do that, you know, what do you need to have in place in order to make sure you feel comfortable and safe and that you're getting a return for your investment? Mm, I love that. Uh, I feel like it applies to not just marketing, but so much outsourcing. Uh, when people are first starting, they're definitely bootstrapping, trying to make ends meet. But that that really should be a phase that you move out of pretty quickly. And the idea that a lot of these people are so educated in these areas and know so many things beyond you. Um, you know, I even just think about hiring Jen, uh, my executive assistant, who that title isn't, I mean, she just started with me in January, uh, but that doesn't even start to capture what all she does and her knowledge. And she's more expensive than my previous executive assistant, but she's done this for years. And in the first weekend that she took over my email, she did organization and workflow that I've never seen. And Mm. it, it has saved me so much money for her being efficient that I'm probably paying about the same amount and she's working fewer hours. Uh, And so uh, it's pretty amazing when you have the right people in the right seats, like they talk about in traction, uh, just how far that goes. And with marketing, it's the same sort of thing. You know, why why do that stuff yourself when there's people that are clearly experts in that area, if if you can afford it and ROI, all that you said. Well, I want to make sure that we have time to talk a little bit about this conference. Uh, I know we covered a lot just on marketing, um, but tell us about the Mental Health Marketing Conference. Tell us like who tends to go to it. Uh, what should people expect from the speakers? Like who is it for? Who's it not for? Take us through the conference. Oh, thank you, Joe. I, I'd love to do that. Um, there are three kind of profiles of people that come. One is the executive or the C-level, and they may be wearing a a clinical hat as well, but um, they're maybe leading a group practice or maybe they have their own um, solo practice. Um, uh, So we we attract them and we'll talk a lot about things like market strategy and mergers and acquisitions and, um, you know, profitability, uh, things of that nature that would resonate with somebody in that seat. And then we attract a lot of marketers. We attract marketers from behavioral health organizations that are large enough to have their own marketing team or their own marketing professional in-house. And then we attract a lot of marketing agencies that have behavioral health or addiction treatment or mental health clients or want to have that that kind of clientele. Um, or they're sending their, their, um, their staff to, again, like I said, learn the language of mental health um, for whatever reason. It may just be personal development. And then we have uh, the third bucket. And these aren't in any specific order, but the clinician and provider who's who's uh, kind of a dedicated clinician or therapist, and they're coming to learn, or maybe they're, they're doing their own marketing themselves. Maybe they just started their business uh, and they know they need to do sort of this marketing thing. So in that case, we provide a lot of 101 courses, and we have some exciting people coming. Uh, I mean, 101 all the way to, of course, your kind of 301 courses. Um, We have LinkedIn coming. They're sending a senior content strategist. Uh, We have 
uh, the, the events manager, events marketing manager from Mental Health America, uh, the national association or organization. We have uh, Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation coming with uh, their creative lead and a panel of youth brand ambassadors. So we've got some really exciting people coming to the table. All in all, we'll have um, close to 70 speakers, probably a few more than 70 speakers. Um, some Can of I just those pause are, you real quick yeah. and say, damn, Steve, look at you. <laughs> I just need to like say, what? You're like, each one that you list, I'm like, LinkedIn, like Lady Gaga's people, like what? Like, well done. So I just have to pause. It. Now you can keep going. <laughs> Whoa, Joe, that's so cool. That gives me the chills. And it's, I'm so fortunate and I, I keep my feet on the ground and you made a point really early on either ahead of when we hit record or at the, in the intro uh, about the the mojo and the potential to find the tribe or find the group of people that you just resonate uh, at a certain level and I've never had the universe drop more people into my space to have a meaningful, conversation that turns into a long-term relationship that is beneficial for everybody involved. So I, I mean, I, it's so cool to hear you say that because you're operating, operating on another level than I am. I've got tons I can learn from you. Um, and, and so, so for the conference to, to hit you like that is super cool. Mm, man. Well, so tell us the dates, tell us the costs. Um, I know that at the end, you're going to drop a discount code too for my audience that's unique to us. But you know, what's the typical cost? What's the typical date? Or not typical? What are the dates? Where is it? All those just logistical details? Yeah, so it's September 25 through 27. So that's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just south of Nashville, Tennessee, there's this cute town, Franklin, Tennessee, uh, with a wonderful venue called The Factory. Uh, if you're looking for some fun mixed with business, uh, the weekend prior to the conference, there's a music festival called the Pilgrimage Festival. And uh, Chris Stapleton headlined last year. They've got some great names this year. Um, so that could be a, a fun little way to get into Nashville and and do some boot scooting or listen to some music and then <laughs> roll into the conference. Um, but yeah, so it's just south of Nashville, about 15, 20 minutes, September 25 through 27. Awesome. Well, and we'll have all the details of how people can grab their tickets at the end. Um, and unfortunately, I can't come. I'm going to be seeing Coldplay out in uh, L.A. Uh, during that exact same week. But 2024, uh, I'm going to get that on my calendar when you guys have those dates, because I love a good reason to go south. Um, the last question I always ask, Steve, is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Hmm. I'd want them to know two things. One is that your work is so important and it's so important to the people that you're helping. And it's so important to this tidal wave of change where we've seen this latent demand or this demand we couldn't speak of or give a name to. Uh, and that's what the stigma is, is, is the stigma of mental health care and not just the mental health or mental illness challenges that we face. Um, so I'd say continue that work and continue the fight. And there's lots of ways to get innovative with that. There's lots of ways to maximize um, sort of the work you're doing. And then my own, from my own experience and the ability to, to look back five or six years when I wasn't in a place where I could maybe have this much impact on any sort of mental health conversation, the thing that did it for me was working on myself. And so Sometimes we see this in marketing agencies and sometimes we see it with some therapists or providers where we've got to eat our own dog food, right? We've got to care for ourselves and, uh, and sometimes doing the hard yards of the emotional work gets left behind. Uh, the cobbler's kids have no shoes. You know, these kinds of phrases are around for a reason. So be sure that you're caring for yourself as as the individual in order to continue that great work across the collective and the community. I love that. I love that so much, that idea of our own continual growth. Well, Steve, uh, where can they pick up their ticket? Where can they learn more about the Mental Health Marketing Conference? And we'll also have links to all this in the show notes. Uh, and also let's give them that discount code too. Yeah, let's give them the discount code for sure. So our website is M as in mental, H as in health, marketing, Dot org. 
So mhmarketing.org. You can find the agenda there. It's all up online, the speakers, the hotel, the venue, all of that. And uh, when you go to get your ticket, use discount code Joe, J-O-E, for 20% extra. And we're also running an early bird special now through August. So you could really double down on the discounts and save some dollars. We've always kept the prices moderate because... Uh, not every therapist has a big budget, so we want to make sure anybody who wants to come can, but you will connect with that magical community um, that, that shows up year after year. So use Joe for 20% off as a discount code. Yes. Use me for 20% off, everybody. <laughs> and this year, you know, we're not doing Slowdown School. We're not doing Killing It Camp. Uh, we took a pause this year. So you've got all that conference money, I'm sure, sitting allocated for conferences. Use it to, to check out this conference. Well, Steve, thank you so much for being on the Practice of the Practice podcast. Joe, thanks so much for having me on. It's really uh, a fun, enjoyable time. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Well, I don't know about you, but, you know, especially after the pandemic, you know, having in-person events uh, are just so important. I remember when I was at Podcast Movement out in L.A., uh, and it was their, their West Coast version of it, and, you know, I met, I met so many cool people there. But I remember I was sitting, and the people behind me were from Amazon, and they were talking about doing more podcasting through their streaming service. And it was like these big time companies that were just hanging out there and they're just people working at Amazon, but having these important meetings at conferences that are in person, you never know who you're gonna run into. You never know where that one person that you have a drink with, uh, you know, is gonna just, you know, open some door for you. Um, actually, when I was at Podcast Movement, when it was in Nashville uh, a couple years ago, uh, there was a free uh, espresso and cappuccino uh, thing right in the middle. Um, that iHeartRadio was putting on. And I made it a commitment that whenever I was in line, I would not look at the person's name tag to see where they were from. And I would just start talking to them as if they were just a regular person so I wouldn't get intimidated or worried. And the amount of cool people that I met at that conference, it was amazing. And so the same thing can happen when you go to conferences, uh, you'll like this. So make sure you check it out. Make sure you click on that link and uh, use that promo code Joe at checkout um, to get that 20% out off. Um, also, we couldn't do shows like this uh, without our amazing sponsor. And actually, this conference is not a sponsor. I just reached out to them and said, I want to help promote this. So if you're like, oh, did they pay to be on here? No, they didn't. They're just awesome. So, uh, but our sponsors that do pay, we want to make sure that we give them shout outs that you go check them out. Alma is such an amazing company and they give clinicians the tools they need to build thriving private practices. And when you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access enhanced reimbursement rates with major payers. You can learn more about building a thriving private practice over at Alma uh, at their website, helloalma.com forward slash Joe. Again, that's hello, A-L-M-A.com slash Joe to get started. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one. <laughs>